Uh, good afternoon. It's a really uh, pleasure for me to be here. Um, on one of the days when uh, spring came early here at Villanova, uh, in the middle of February, uh, for us in the Northeast, I found myself watching uh, basketball games uh, and students playing playing those games. And it was really warm, so they were going to get out and just have fun. Um, and they were just outside enjoying themselves. It was a graceful, as I thought of it, a graceful moment for them. Um, they were playing um, in mid-February in shorts and t-shirts. And uh, it was a complete blessing for them. And um, so it was just joyful for me to be walking by. It was right out here. Actually, the courts, uh, they're tennis courts, but they were all full with basketball players. They were just getting out and having fun. And uh, then I happened to see uh, a group of them reenacting the famous Chris Jenkins National Championship shot. And that was, that was fun. They were playing. And um, it was fun for them, I could see. And it was fun for me just to watch it. Um, now, this was before this team from Wisconsin happened upon us. And they probably, as if it was now, we would be, they'd be, they wouldn't be playing. They might be crying. But, but I digress. I digress. <laughs> you have to get through those moments. It's tough watching the games right now, as, as we, I'm sure we would all say. Uh, what I'd like to do in my 10 minutes is to look briefly um, at some of the tradition, what some of the tradition, tradition might say about that experience of those students, having fun, uh, playing. Um, so I'll start with Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic theologian. In his Summa Theologica, wrote that play is good not just because it's a release from work, not just because it's a release from work, but play is good for its own sake. It's enjoyable and it's freeing. Thomas goes as far to say that, that to not play, to not play, is or to take things way too seriously could possibly be considered a sin. We look at it in one perspective. In New Seeds of Contemplation, Thomas Merton, one of the preeminent spiritual writers of the 20th century, he writes, what is serious to men and women, he didn't use that language, but I'll use it, because I think if he knew now, if he knew then what he, we know now, he would, use, would have used it. So what is serious to men and women is often very trivial in the sight of God. What in God might appear to us as play is perhaps what he himself takes most seriously. At any rate, the Lord plays and diverts himself in the garden and his creation. And if we would let go of our own obsession, what we think is the meaning of it all, we might be able to hear his call and follow God in God's mysterious cosmic dance. We might ha not have to go very far to catch echoes of that game. Unquote. Finish the quote from Merton. And what he goes on to talk about is noticing very simple things, such as simple but profound things, I would say. Um, the migration of birds taking a, a rest in a tree, just noticing those. Children at play, he says, or knowing love in our hearts, or an old frog splashing into a pond. Just noticing those things can be spiritual, and I, he didn't see, he would say also playful. And, and, may, and I would say, I would add, that students playing basketball with great enthusiasm, 
and with passion on an early warm day in February. He would want us to take that seriously, God that is, and Merton. More recently, Andrew Cooper, in his work Playing in the Zone, exploring the spiritual dimensions of sports, said that the, says that the problem with sports or play is not that we take them too seriously, but that we take them not seriously enough. Merton and Cooper are s saying similar things. They both believe that we can easily undervalue play and sports. What is worth taking seriously, we underrate, and what is not worth taking seriously, we overvalue. We lose perspective. We don't see them clearly or rightly. The sociologist Peter Berger, in his work, Rumor of Angels, lists what he calls signals of transcendence, ordinary experiences which he believes are indicators of the transcendent in our midst. Along with such common experiences such as humor, hope, and order, he lists play. If, if viewed correctly, play can reveal to us God's presence. He believes joy is the intention of play. Joy is the intention of play. The Jesuit priest and scientist Teilhard de Chardin said, the most infallible sign of the presence of God is joy. And that is, um, as Peter Berger is saying, that's the intention of play, to give us joy. Stuart Brown, a medical doctor, psychiatrist, and clinical researcher, and founder of the National Institute for Play, wrote a book entitled, entitled Play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination, and Invigorates the Soul. And I love that subtitle. I'll say it again. Play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination, and Invigorates the Soul. That subtitle really does say a lot. And Brown believes that play and sport can energize us and enliven us. They can lighten us up. It's interesting to look at the etymology of the word sport. It, that is, uh, sport comes from this sport to divert or amuse which is derived really from the Latin des porto, which means to carry away, to carry us away, to experience maybe a timelessness. Play can do that for us. If we're really focused in it, we can forget about uh, all of our worries. We can be amused. We can possibly be even entertained. But it can, it can carry us away, and sport can do that. Brown goes on to comment that neuroscientists, developmental bio biologists, social scientists, and researchers from every point of the scientific compass now know that play is a profound biological process. It has evolved over eons in many animal species to promote survival. It shapes the brain and makes animals smarter and more adaptable. In higher animals like us, it fosters empathy and makes possible complex social groups. For us, play lies at the core of creativity and innovation. And here, as I was reading this, I thought of um, the founder or president of Wawa. Everybody around here, most of us here, though you may not know of Wawa, <laughs> but uh, it's a big hit around here. And um, one of my friends went to uh, interview him. And as he went, in, went into his office, he saw 
He had toys all in his office. He had crowns, crayons, crowns as we would say in Philly. Um, and it, these are all these toys that were in his office. And he's known for his uh, innovation, creativity. And, and his, notion, his idea was, when my friend asked him why, he says he wants people to be playful. He wants the people to use their imagination when they come in the office, especially as employees. And, and that really has, uh, I think, had a lot to do with the success of Wawa. Nicole Lavoie has written that positive youth development can be promoted through sports, play, and physical activity. So we are designed, we are built as human beings, we are built to find fulfillment and creative growth through play. So in conclusion, on how long I've taken, I would say play on to those students and even to us. The students on an unseasonably warm, beautiful February day had it right. Play on. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Villanova University and the different units involved in this event for inviting me uh, to participate. Special thanks go to Stephanie uh, Naus for liaising with me regarding my participation uh, in this event. And, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, maybe I'm at play. We'll see. Um, I'm delighted for several reasons. Um, this is my first time on campus, and uh, first impression is, is great. We'll see the second impression. <laughs> I'm delighted to share this event with a group of distinguished colleagues and professionals, and of course, with, with all of you, the audience. And I'm delighted that Villanova University decided to host this event to reflect on the role of a sport in human flourishing. Winning last year's men's NCAA National Basketball Championship was a significant accomplishment for the institution. Yet, instead of simply basking in its aftermath, as many institutions would have been tempted to do, Villanova University decided to ask about the role of athletic pursuits in people's lives at both individual and collective levels. Kudos. And you are still the champion until the end of this tournament, so there's a reason to, to, to still bask. Right. I'm delighted to be here uh, because the organizers decided to center the event on an issue that is eminently philosophical. Even more, this issue has been eminently central to philosophy since Aristotle's reflections back in ancient Greece. Aristotle wanted us to think about what is a flourishing life, a life in which we achieve what he calls eudaimonia, a well-lived life. He also wanted us to think about what kind of pursuit would lead to such a life. Thus, in an important sense, what this event invites us to do is to think about whether a sport could be one of the activities constitutive of a meaningful life, of a flourishing life. This is at the core of the philosophy of a sport, whose key questions I've written include, quote, inquiring what role a sport should play in a satisfactory life, what it means to live a sport satisfactorily, and what type of satisfaction emerges from a life dedicated to sport, end quote. Important as these questions are, for many people, philosophy and sport are pursuits that do not belong together. While the majority of people accept, if at times only begrudgingly, the enormous relevance that sport has in contemporary society, a large number of people doubt or question the relevance of philosophy, let alone its connection to sport. But if philosophers consider the history of the discipline, it is not hard to see we are largely responsible for this public perception of our trade. For a good part of the 20th century, philosophers, and more precisely those working in academia, focused exclusively on abstract, abstract concepts and narrow technical disputes that were of little concern to the lives of most people. No wonder, then, that many people consider philosophy to be a discipline that has little utility. It is useless. For these people. They are wrong. <laughs> However, philosophy doesn't have to be like this. Embracing its power to help us analyze, clarify, and understand the reality we live in, philosopher, philosophy surely can and should help us make sense of, negotiate, and enrich our lives. This should, in my view, include our sporting pursuits. This, I take, is the gist of this event. 
after winning last year, and I'm not going to say men's NCAA National Basketball Championship, although I did, Villanova University invites us to ask the poignant question, so what? And it is very interesting because we could ask the same question now after the team didn't advance. So what? Right? So this invitation reminds us uh, of the old Socratic dictum that the unexamined life is not worth living. Perhaps the unexamined life is not, con is not conducive to a flourishing life, both in general and with a specific regard to sport. If we are to address the role, if any, of a sport in a flourishing life, we have to say something about the kind of pursuit a sport is. As a species, a species of games, a sports are artificial tests created and regulated by rules. The distinguishing rationale behind a sport is a gratuitous logic that proscribes the use of more efficient in favor of less efficient physical skills to accomplish the stipulated goal. Paraphrasing the analysis of Bernard Schutz, it is possible to say that sports are structured by the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles through the implementation of physical skills. In other words, sports are games designed specifically to test proficiency in physical skills. Following this general principle, the rules of each sport establish a unique relationship between their particular goals and the means to accomplish them in order to specifically test the physical skills relevant to each sport. Indeed, the specificity of each sport's gratuitous logic is responsible for its allure. Thus, for example, basketball is esteemed at Villanova University and beyond because of the unique set of passing, dribbling, and shooting skills it purports to test and everything that comes with it. It is through these highly specialized skills, which I call constitutive and restorative skills, that certain defining excellences are exhibited. Constitutive skills are those meant to be tested and are typically implemented during open play. In basketball, they include a jump shot, fast breaks, layups, and rebounds, among many others. On the other hand, restorative skills are those that are implemented to restore play after an interruption. In basketball, they include free throws and throw wins from out of bounds. Sports are also instances of what Alasdair McIntyre identifies as social practices. This is that is, sports are, quote, coherent and complex forms of socially established cooperative human activity, end of quote, with internal goods and standards of excellence that define them. In sports, the internal goods, those that can only be specified within a practice, are represented by their constitutive and restorative skills. On McIntyre's neo Aristotelian account, it is the internal goods of a practice and its standard of excellence that the members of a practice community, in, this, in the case of sports, athletes, coaches, administrators, referees, and even spectators, should seek to realize, oversee, and protect, as well as to look to when questions arise regarding conduct and change within the practice. This means that members of the practice community should be willing, for example, to recognize and give, give proper credit to those who excel at the practice pay attention to criticism, and make every effort to improve. To put it differently, members of the practice community should be prepared to be just, courageous, and honest. For, as McIntyre proceeds, these virtues, we are social in nature, are needed for the practice to flourish. Otherwise, the practice is rendered pointless. Human flourishing appears to be compatible with the understanding of a sport as a social practice. Following Martha Nussbaum, it could be posited that through Human flourishing requires to actualize potential through exercising functional capabilities. This goes well beyond well-being or quality of life, conceived as the gratification of needs or satisfaction, and reaches into the actualization of potential, the development of talents, predispositions, and experiential possibilities that provide narrative unity to a human life. This is not too far from the Aristotelian conception of human flourishing that included well-being in the sense indicated above, and more importantly, the possession and exercise of virtue. Human flourishing could proceed through and in a variety of practices, one of which is a sport, and take shape in different forms of life, such as an athletic or a sporting way of life. This is a life of commitment and dedication to the internal goods and standard of excellence of some sport or athletic pursuit. The athletic or sporting way of life requires the patient nurturing and and refinement of internal goods and the submission to pre-existent standards of excellence. It promises arduous work, sacrifice, and no guarantee of success, at least success externally defined. It also promises fulfillment, joy, self-knowledge, self-affirmation, and the possibility of success internally defined, 
especially if excellence is not understood as perfection, but rather as improvement. Jesus Ilunda in Agurusa calls the athletic or sporting way of life a skillful striving. It involves fostering not only physical skills, but also the virtues required for fostering these skills. It is precisely through an inner skillful striving, along with the concomitant discipline training demands that we become, for example, basketball players, marathoners, swimmers, cyclists, soccer players, and mountain climbers. Engaging in a sport constitutes a powerful way by which we make sense of ourselves, by which our lives take on a narrative unity, and through which we forge an identity along with others who are also forging their identity through an in engagement in the same sport. Unitary life narratives involve a community's narrative. As Mike McIntyre argues, quote, we are never more and sometimes less than the co-authors of our own narratives, end of quote. Athletes flourish in, in communion with others, challenging each other, assisting each other in order to reveal their strengths, weaknesses, limitations, and potential. While individual, the athletic or sporting way of life is at the same time communal, as it takes place with others who are also pursuing a similar athletic or sporting way of life. In a sense, athletes sustain each other's commitment to the practice community. Before closing, a word of caution regarding some issues that could jeopardize the possibility of human flourishing through and in the sports appears warranted. A main obstacle is the emphasis on external rewards, most notably financial incentives that arguably have nothing to do essential, uh, have nothing essential to do with the sport. As William J. Morgan reasons, quote, to engage fully in a practice like a sport, one must be motivated principal, principally by and committed foremost and outmost to its internal good, end of quote. If that is not the case, the good of the athletic or sporting way of life might certainly not come to be realized. Consider the known consequences of pursuing primarily external rewards in sport, cheating and corruption of different kinds. Suffice to mention doping, fixing games, spying on rivals, corking bats, unintentionally injuring opponents, to mention just a few examples. Another obstacle is that an exclusive devotion to sport might lead to excesses and a single-minded life. There is a fine and messy line to walk between commitment to sport and life's other commitments and responsibilities. Human flourishing demands a sense of balance. When one's involvement in a sport negatively affects other areas of our lives, then things may be thrown out of balance. Avoiding this requires constant reflection, assessment, and adjustment, all necessary elements of human flourishing. It is essential that the athletic or sporting way of life coheres with one's commitments and responsibilities outside sport. To conclude, a sport can and often is a gateway for human flourishing and has the potential to give weight, purpose, and direction to our lives. The Villanova University team that obtained last year's tournament and whose accomplishment ignited this event are exemplars of that potential. While only a possibility, human flourishing through and in a sport can be fostered by coaching, mentoring, and overall structures that cherish it. From Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle in ancient Greece, to countless contemporary observers, there seems to be agreement that the fruitful navigation of the athletic or sporting way of life needs a concerted educational effort. Like in this effort, the type of market society we live in and the values a market society promotes severely curtail the potential of a sport for human flourishing. Thank you. Thank you. Quite an honor to play the cleanup hitter here on this esteemed panel. Um, so thank you for having me. As I was listening to the comments, I thought, you know, I think it is really I meant to be here today with the title of the conversation here today, the, the grace of playing, because sport has dramatically influenced my personal and professional life. I would not be up here without sport. I, too, was a collegiate athlete. I coached at the collegiate level. Now I'm in the academy making my living about studying sport. And my mentor, Dr. Steve Wilkinson, who has now passed away from cancer. He was the men's tennis coach at Gustavus Adolphus College, which is my alma mater. He actually lived on Grace Avenue. <laughs> and if you don't know Steve Wilkinson, he has a great book. It's called Let Love Serve. And he was a theologian. 
and he taught religious studies at Gustavus, and he was the he is still the most winningest tennis coach in college tennis at any division, and he felt very strongly about combining sport as a way for human flourishing, but always pursuing to win. And so, Wilk, I know you're up there looking down going, okay, I get to carry on his legacy of what I learned from him. And so, um, you know, Wilk's mentor was Arthur Ashe, who wrote a book called The Days of Grace. So there's lots of synergy here about grace, and so it's my honor to be here today with you. It's giving me lots of joy, Ed. All right, so as we've heard already, uh, sport is a really powerful social institution, and it is a social process. But sport is also a paradox in so many ways, ways that we've already heard and ways that we'll continue to hear throughout the rest of our conversation today. And so I'm going to take a little bit of a departure from the first two speakers, which is why a panel's so great, because it's like, here you go, talk about your expertise, and then we'll hope it comes together in a meaningful way, which I think it will. Uh, so one of the things that I want to show you is one of these paradoxes is that today, after the passage of Title IX in 1972, which is, if you don't know what Title IX is, it's a civil rights law that uh, dramatically um, increased sport op participation opportunities for girls and women. And you can see this is college data, but the high school data looks very similar that we now have record numbers of girls and women playing sports today more than ever before. And that's true for boys and men as well. Now you might look at that, but the gap isn't narrowing. That's a different talk. I'm going to let that go for now. But in 1972, we had one in 27 girls playing sports. Today, that's about one in three. So the paradox here is that we have record numbers of girls playing sports and getting opportunities to play. So what does that mean in the role of sports playing in the lives of girls and women and men and boys as well? In my role in the Tucker Center um, for research on girls and women in sport, we are the one and only research center of its kind in the whole world that is in a land-grant institution solely dedicated to studying girls and women in sport. And in 97, we did a report, and in 2007, we did the second report. And yes, it's 2017, so we're doing our 10-year update of the 10-year update um, right now. And what we found in this report is that, yes, sport, and if you know, there's a lot going on up there, but if you focus your attention on that side where the arrow is, there are a lot of possible potential positive outcomes when you are given the opportunity to participate in sport, from health to physical to psychological to social to moral and spiritual um, to even academic and career-based positive outcomes. And what's really cool about this, and this is true for boys and men, so this is, you know, sport participation can provide the opportunity for human flourishing. And I'll get to maybe the, the caveats of that in a moment. But what we know even from recent data that's done by Ernst & Young, for girls and women, we know now that participation in sport can lead to very high achievement in the workplace. They surveyed uh, 400 Fortune 500 C-suite executives that were women across four countries. And what they found was a large, large majority of those women played sport. That's not coincidental. So as a researcher, you look at that statistic and go, something is going on here that when girls and women are given the opportunity to play sport, they achieve at very high levels. And a couple of weeks ago on spring break, I was at ASU talking to their female student athletes. And I told them, look, you are really wanted in the marketplace right now. And I showed them the statistic. Leverage that. So we know that sport can be a positive place for development and human flourishing, but we also have a cliche in moral development um, and sports psychology that, yeah, sport can build character but it can also build characters. 
And that's the caveat here. It, just because we play sports doesn't mean we get all these positive benefits. It depends. And I was in um, my hotel room last night prepping for this, and this came across my Facebook feed. And I thought, I'm putting that in my presentation. Because there are many examples, this is one, of ways that sports maybe did not create positive development, or people in sports or athletes are not behaving in ways that we might want them to. So we know also from the research that while sport can provide positive outcomes when done right, it can also result in a host of negative outcomes. And uh, Caesar and Ed have laid out some of those when we don't do sport right we get a host of negative outcomes. So what I want to talk about here specifically related to my area of expertise, which is gender, is that, yes, here's the paradox. Girls and women get to play sports in record numbers. That's great. But um, there are a lot of ways sport can reproduce damaging and outdated gender stereotypes that are not good for girls and women. And one of those ways that we see this is that even in sport, who we see, what roles are they in, how much power do they have, that gender roles in sport at all levels from youth to college to pro reproduce gender divisions of labor that children and athletes see and then take that up to be truth. So this is the soccer mom who washes the uniform, brings the treat, drives the kids back and forth, while the dad is an active role model who's playing or coaching. And I could get into all the data, but I'm not going to. Um, but just trust me that there is an extreme gender division of labor in all levels of sport. And here's a good uh, graph at the collegiate level. So what this is, is this shows women in positions of power in collegiate athletics in the big of the big, the power five, the FBS. And what you see here is as the position becomes more lucrative, more powerful, and more visible, we find fewer women. I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. And I give lots of talks about the why, but we, I'm not going into that right now. We could get into that if you want. And what we know is here's the other paradox. We have record numbers of girls and women playing sports, but we have a near record low of women coaching women. In Title IX, about 90% of women coached women at the collegiate level. Today, that's around 40%, give or take a plus or minus two. Okay? And in the last 10 years, it's completely stagnant. So if you know this literature, you always think of like the decline, the decline, the decline of women in coaching. That's gone. The decline happened a long time ago. If you look at that graph, and I'm inviting you to shift the narrative with me, this is about stagnation. There's no decline anymore. It's stagnant. Okay. And so what happens here with gender then, so as a sociologist, who we see where we see them, and how we see them matters. So if you, it's, we're in March Madness now, so there's Gino. And what we know is that gender bias is alive and well in society, and particularly in sport. So when we think of a coach, what it means to coach, being authoritarian, being in command, having control, telling people what to do, making tough calls, making tough decisions, these are behaviors that privilege men and masculinity. So when we think of what does it mean to coach, men are already thought of as the coach. And when women do similar behaviors, i.e. they act like men, they are discriminated against, harassed, and sometimes fired because they're being mean or bullies or acting inappropriately. And there's plenty of lawsuits around the country right now where this is taking place. So yes, sport can promote human flourishing and positive development, but when we bring gender into the mix, um, it can get complicated. So again, role models, who we see in what positions. The other way that gender comes in, 
and gets constructed socially is what we see in the media. And I'm sure Kevin is going to speak to this as an expert in the sport media. But we know that 43% of all athletes are women. 43%. They get 2 to 4% of all sport media coverage. So it's disproportionate. So who we see and how we see them matters. Now, not only are they drastically underrepresented in the sport media, although I have a feeling this is going to start ticking upwards, I'm hopeful, is that when they are, they're oftentimes portrayed in ways that highlight their femininity and sexuality instead of their athletic competence. Who knows who this is? Raise your hand. Who is it? Okay. Well, how many people knew who this was? Raise your hand. Okay, look around, okay? Not many. Did, and how, you wouldn't know she was a soccer player, one of the best soccer players. Now, if you looked at this picture, that tells you a very different message. So the way we code this in sports sociology is on the court, in action, in her uniform. Oh, for 3 on that one. 3 for 3 on this one. It connotes a very different message. Same thing with Serena. Some, time, some people are calling her the greatest of all time. These are very different images of very powerful, successful female athletes. And what this tells us for girls and women is when we see most of the time these feminine, sexy images of female athletes, which do not focus on their athleticism, it tells girls and women it's more important what you look like and a very narrow vision of what a female should look like than what your body can do, how it can, what it can do in play. And the sexualization of girls, there's a lot been written on it, but it can lead to a lot of negative outcomes for girls. So let's situate this issue, and um, we've heard a little bit about sport exists in context as a powerful social institution societally, organizationally, in families, and at the individual level, it affects us at all levels. So societally, there's a lot that goes on for girls and women, or women of color, or for gay women, that cannot lead to human flourishing, because sport is a sexist context. And there's a lot of data to back me up on that. And I think if we really want sport to be a part of human flourishing, that has got to be addressed. And I recently gave a talk at the, um, the National Soccer Coaches Association, where there's very few women soccer coaches. And I just pulled off some recent headlines. It is a sexist context. And I was talking to Jill Ellis, who's the head coach of the women's national team, yesterday morning, and she's like, I'm, I'm the anomaly. We don't have a Pat Summit in women's soccer. We don't have soccer women's soccer coaching legends. And I said, well, we have one. We have you. And she kind of laughed. This is true. So sport is full of paradox. It can lead to human flourishing when done right. It can also lead to the opposite when done wrong. And really, it largely depends on the adults in the climate who coach, parent, and administer sport at all levels. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, to Dr. Torres's point, the so what, right? So we don't have a lot of women coaching women. So what? I get this question all the time. Why should we care? Here, here's my response. Young boys and men, 100% of the time, get a male coaching role model. 100%. And I'll, I'll be proven wrong if someone in this room is who male has only been coached by women. This doesn't happen unless it's your mom and you quit when you're 10. Okay? Um, I am not saying men shouldn't coach women. What I'm saying is that girls and women should be afforded the opportunity to have a same-sex role model, just like boys and men. And that women can also be good role models for boys and men, as many male coaches are for girls and women. So the, we know from the data that same-sex role models lead to better self-perceptions, you can identify with them, you can be a role model, you be emulated. Um, a lot of women go into coaching because they've had female coaches, and we know that from the data. When you're coached by women, you're more likely to go into coaching. So there are lots of reasons why the so what, um, and I think that's important. And girls are de tell us they're desperate for active female role models, and coaches are such a powerful influence in the lives of young people. Yeah, there's no doubt um, in my own experience that uh, coaches have a huge role um, in self-esteem, uh, the power of winning and losing, mentoring. Um, and and uh, that's uh, just looking at that, seeing that statistic for me, um, it somewhat saddens me. But, right? Uh, but we look at somebody like Gino. Mm -hmm. Women's basketball, Gino wins. So Gino's going to stay. And he continues to win. But is that the only reason? I'm not against Gino. He's from Philly. <laughs> I know Gino. Um, but is that the best? A question for me would be, have many of Gino's uh, former players been coaching? I don't know. Some. Yeah, some of them. One of the advanced things we're starting to look at is um, this lineage of the coaching tree. Yeah. So what's your greatest um, reflection of making an impact on young people as they want to be like you? You know, a long history of a coaching tree might be one way that we can sort of learn more about this. So he does have some that have gone into coaching. I guess my question to both of you, who took, you know, more of a philosophical approach to, you know, how do we get sport to lead to eudaimonic well-being and human flourishing? You know, how do you see that philosophical standpoint intersecting with what we know in terms of the college arms race right now and collegiate athletics. How do we rectify that? <laughs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> you know, we could also first uh, answer with questions. So that's what I'm going to do. Oh, I see how uh, that's, that's what we do. Uh, well, but, but that presupposes that there's something to be rescued. I, I would question that very, uh, that, that very premise, that there is something to be rescued. Uh, maybe what we have to do is to go the way we do things at my school, Division Three. So I, I, I leave that open. Um, yeah, the arms race, um, the thing about, from my perspective, the arms race, it, it, it's endless. It, it never ends. Uh, and it's so easy to lose perspective on winning and losing. Um, and the rich get richer. You know, that just tends to happen. And we can easily lose perspective on it. So I don't, I don't have answers for it. Um, I love the questions and um, the discussions. But you look at, I'm looking the other day at the top recruits for football. Where are they going? And, you know, it's, it's the same people every year. And um, because they have the best facilities, um, maybe the most money, I dare say, um, 
And uh, but there's no doubt the rich get richer and it just seems to me the um, get worse in one point. I mean look, it's not only that, uh, as uh, Leonard Cohen used to sing, the rich get rich and the poor get poor. So if the rich get rich, that would be one thing. There's also that the poor get poorer. <laughs> So uh, we have two problems there, not only one, that is the accumulation of wealth, is that those at the, uh, not even the bottom, uh, but the bottom 80%, 90%, uh, they are suffering more and more. So I'm more concerned about those at the bottom and those at the top. Uh, I'm concerned about the poor, the disadvantage. Downtrodden, I believe that's another English word that, that we use, right? <laughs> uh, of course, I'm also concerned about uh, the obscene accumulation of wealth. Mm -hmm. But I also care about those who are now suffering. But of course, we need to pay attention to the arms race. But look, um, nothing against uh, you know, the, the way you, you put that together, but we have to be mindful in the sports of the narrative we build. So talking about an arms race, uh, puts the emphasis on warfare, instead of the mutuality that sport is about, the, 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 the communal aspect. Right? It's complex. I don't know where that train went, but I like that. Well, I'm trying to think what would the alternative narrative be. It's not the college arms race, it would be the college... The insanity of whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, exercise my moderator's privilege and, and ask a question. Uh, do you think that there are some sports that are inherently more or less inclined towards um, uh, building characters rather than character? In other words, all three of you touched upon how we have this mix of development and decline in sports, or we can use theological language of thin and gray. But are there some sports that you think um, are more susceptible? Some of that could be cultural, but I'm also wondering, just by the very nature of the games and the rules, uh, and what occurs out on the field. You know, I I'm inclined to say that all sports are equally um, apt to produce character to characters. I mean, I think some sports are seen more in the media, so it might seem like certain sports like the big four are producing more or characters because we hear about it all yeah. the time. But I think I've never seen any data to say that these sports, you're going to come out with character and these sports, yeah, I'm not so sure. That's a very interesting mm -hmm. question. Um, I would have to say more about that. But maybe I can tell you sports that might not be conducive to... Uh, moral development. Um, this might be controversial uh, because there's some data backing up that boxing might, especially in communities that have been disadvantaged, uh, could be a way out. But the very nature of boxing, what you are required to do, the intrinsic goal is to hit another human being, to injure another human being to harm another human being. Whether you want to do it or not, that's what you have to do. You, you can't hit, that's a bad move, I know, but um, <laughs> very weak, so I will be hit badly. Uh, you can't hit and say, I'm really sorry, I don't mean it. In order to be a good boxer, you need to get the heck out of your opponent. And uh, it seems to me that that could be morally ob ob objectionable. Now, I know that there are issues about consent, um, and autonomy, but I think that those issues could be neutralized uh, through some other argumentation. Mm -hmm. If you can achieve the same moral development through other sports, I would prefer to accomplish that moral development through these other sports that are not morally objectionable in itself. American football is a different issue. I wouldn't say that it's, and I know that sociologists love to say that it's violent, I would say that, um, we need to define what violence is to make a case that uh, 
football is a violent sport. Mm -hmm. But there's no question that we have to be very much concerned about what happens to the brain uh, of uh, those, uh, those athletes. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open the conversation to everyone gathered here. If you have a, a question, you can uh, raise your hand, and I'll acknowledge you. Maybe just uh, uh, stand up and, and be loud and project. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just jump in to. I'm sorry, we have to stand up. No, you don't have to. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to jump into the arms race um, question. Um, when you talked about uh, your concern for the poor and the downtrodden, and I was thinking about who those are. You know, you were speaking sort of at an institutional level, I think, right? So we're talking about a couple of dozen D1 schools that generate profits from athletics, and then hundreds that do not. And those hundreds that do not, um, the recent studies I've seen through the Chronicle of Higher Education suggest that hidden student fees are subsidizing the athletic department. So at those schools, it seems to me those students are, in a certain sense, the poor that are being poor, mm -hmm. in a way. At schools like where I work at, the University of Michigan, where there is um, a profit-positive uh, athletic department, I would argue it is still the students, um, but in this case, the students who are also athletes on the revenue-generating team, that are getting poor. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw those details into that discussion. I mean, we may talk about it more later or not. Just one little thing about that. Uh, at public institutions, it, it seems to me that the citizens of that particular state is also subsidizing um, mm. this, this activity. Uh, well, that is the case of that is the case of my public institution because the athletic department is financing a ton of the institution. Wait a second. Exception. One yes, of, no, not many. Though. One no, 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the few exceptions. Yeah. yeah. And there might be a gap for that. Well, uh, Jerry? Uh, Jerry Byer, I'm a member of the Office of Research Studies. So I'm glad we're talking about the poor. Uh, today is the feast day of Blessed Oscar Romero, who was shot dead on the altar in San Salvador for speaking about the rights of the poor. Uh, I want to just expand the conversation a little bit. Uh, when you talk rightly, uh, Cesar, about the poor becoming an obsession, I worry that it even has become idolatrous in a lot of ways. Uh, so I'm thinking about, for example, the, the corporatization and the contracts with uh, companies like Nike. There's an article here called March Madness Conflict the Confines that Make Up an NCAA Apparel Supply Chain. It's in a journal called Supply Chain Guide. I'm just going to read a couple of quotations. Three of the large apparel companies, Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour, received 250 million dollars in college contracts in 2014. In 2015, the University of Texas at Austin signed a 15-year, $250 million deal with Nike. We have a deal with Nike at Illinois University. Nike workers making those shoes in Indonesia and elsewhere are making $3.50 a day. In Indonesia, that's not enough to buy a gallon of milk. So when we talk about the poor, we have to think about those workers, too, and our complicity. In the capitalist tradition, we talk about this as cooperation and evil. Great. Uh, and we are talking about higher education. Uh, I ask my students to look around our classrooms. And doesn't it feel so good to look around and see a space, a public space, kind of public space, in which there's no advertising, in which this very second my lecture is brought to buy. <laughs> are, are we moving in that direction? Is that the way we want to, to go? Um, the field in higher education, where there are many things to think about, uh, reflect, change. And as much as commercial enterprises have intruded into higher education, still um, we are resisting. Public life has been so commodified. You go to a restroom and you have a screen telling you things when you're trying to do what physiologically we do. Uh, it, it, it's such an intrusion. It's such, it's tiring. It's, uh, it, it's, it's 
it's, it's more than tiring. It's, it's, it's numbing. I, I, don't, I don't have an answer other than just think about these issues and press the, the type of issues that you mentioned and uh, you know, think together and, and resist. Yeah, uh, Jerry, it's, it's really good. You're bringing up really good points, and, 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 and there's, there's a time and place when sports can get way out of hand, and it can rule um, the person and, and institution. And, um, and I think we need to face some of that stuff. And, and, and we don't all know some of those figures that you just, you know, spelled out. Um, and yet, um, we will wear that paraphernalia and, and want to get sponsorship from those places, Nike, and, and not just Nike. So it, it can get out of perspective, and, and there's no doubt about it. And um, I guess the question is, yeah, and I, I think you're pointing out another paradox is that sport can oppress and marginalize and sport can empower and it can do both at the same time. That's what makes sport such an interesting context. And you know, sport can be a way out for a select few, not many. And sport can leave others destitute because they're being exploited and commoditized and commercialized and left with no education and no and no pathway if they're injured or they don't make it. So, you know, as a person who studies sport, this is there's constant paradox all the time, and you know, then you're left with okay, then what do we do? And, you know, as a sociologist, we always go back to, well, it's about power, right? And if it's about power, then it's about money. I think one of the reasons why we wanted to hold this, as we were putting this together and thinking about it, was um, can we, at Villanova, having won the national championship at the top of the hill, in one sense, uh, can we keep perspective on who we are? And in the midst of that, and it's it's not easy to do that. Uh, but um, we wanted to um, ask the question before it can get really out of hand, um, and, and that that can easily happen. Um, we thought it was important from um, the algae department to, if it's not there, where are we going to do it? Uh, to ask questions about uh, the poor, to ask questions about is winning always the most important thing. What happens when we lose? Um, I think, Cesar, you were asking some of those questions. Does that mean we're nothing when we lose? Sometimes losing can really be a good thing. Sometimes. Um, not always. But winning isn't always the best thing either. We won the national championship, as I said. And can we ask those questions? What does it mean? Would, are, are we entitled to something when we win? What happens if we don't win, as we didn't in men's basketball? So just questions. Can I just add to this um, this conversation about um, Nike and idolatry? And, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the name Sonny Vaccaro, who is who kind of is seen as the you know the kind of guy that gave birth to the shoe deal and things like that, and then it's conversation with Sonny, he said something really interesting to me, and that was, I didn't make the deal by myself. Who was in the room? Who did I make the deal with? University. And so often I feel like in this conversation about idolatry and the arms race, and we always try to otherize some monster of the interlopers, the Nikes, the, the athletes that come in and, you know, they, they don't care about academics or whatever it is, we, we create this kind of other that is threatening our integrity when it's the institutions of higher learning that invited these conversations. And it's not about losing ball games, it's about losing money. And I think that some of the questions around loss 
are really, um, there's almost a mythology around, oh, this is so good, we're learning how to lose. When universities really haven't learned how to lose because there, there is no university, even Division three schools, who have said a, a clear no to the, the commercialization of sports. It, it's a source of revenue, whether it helps you get students in your school or, and that's, I don't, I'm not saying that's necessarily it's so fact so bad, but I do believe we kind of get caught up in this mythology. If, if we could only get rid of the Nikes of the world or, you know, the Sonny Viteros or the people who are, quote unquote, you know, making a living off of this beast. When, when really the ones that are making a living off of these are the institutions that really are uncomfortable with it kind of making their integrity come into question. I just, I, I want to sort of back that point up with an anecdote. Um, about a year, a few years ago now, we got a new president at the University of Michigan. Um, Dr. Mark Schlissel, and um, I was in a conversation with him about some of these issues, and he said that, um, yeah, these are big problems. Um, he had a lot of conversations with other college presidents before he took the Michigan job. He had come from Brown, so he wasn't necessarily facing the same kinds of issues with respect to athletics as here at Michigan. And he had a lot of conversations with other presidents before he took the Michigan job. Every single one of them told him, don't try to do anything about athletics. Don't touch it. Um, it will get your wheel stuck in the mud. Every other thing you want to do at that institution will not happen. Um, so, speaking of how that really does play out concretely, even at the uh, very high level of the institution, um, there's just a calculation there made, and it's not a, it's not one he's making in the big, with out of malice, I think, uh, or a lack of care. Uh, about the issues, it's that it's a big institution. It's he's doing a lot of he's trying to get a lot of things going, and there's it's a sense that he can't build this life sciences center or recruit faculty for that, let's say, because um, that's dependent on certain factors that are going to dry up if I start taking on athletics. It's going to tie me up in the media. It's going to tie up alumni. So I'm going to just let that ship continue to sail in the same direction. You know, one of the things you made me think of. That Notre Dame conference, I think you were there, Nicole, if you remember this. But um, one of the key participants in this conference, it's not exactly on this point, but um, said that um, if a coach gets fired for anything else but a win and loss record, they're going to get rehired. Anything else. If somebody's not winning, uh, they could get fired, and they may not get rehired. But if they get fired for something else, like cheating, and the list goes on and on, for cheating, for recruiting violations, or paying, or whatever, scandals, they're going to get rehired. Because it all comes down. Not if they're women. Interesting point. Not if they're women. Interesting point. Yeah. Is that is that true? Well, not 100%, but it's a trend. Yeah. And I would add, not if they stand up for players' rights. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you guys talk a little bit about the phenomenon of observing or watching sport and how that has an impact on student flourishing either as a child or as an adult as a community? There's some literature uh, on that. Uh, at least the, the, the literature I'm familiar with is philosophical. And some philosophers have argued that um, there's the potential to develop morally through spectating. I would make the case that uh, spectators have duties as well. And those duties re might refer back to the conceptualization of a sport as a social practice in McIntyre terms. So 
Um, if you are a spectator in your team and your team is mis misbehaving, maybe what we should do is turn the TV off or walk out the stadium. Um, or if our uh, beloved team is cheating and there's proof of that, uh, where allegiance, I guess that our allegiance should not be ultimate, unquestionable. But I'm from South America, so, um, you know, it, it, it's instead of uh, your country right or wrong, it's your team right or wrong. And that seems to be a very pernicious um, view. You know, your country went right, your team went right. And went wrong, you question. Because that seems to be... Um, the patriotic way, right? Uh, but, but we need to conceptualize what patriotism is or uh, what you owe to your team and, uh, and so on. So the potential is there, but as Nicole said, and I briefly mentioned it, it, it depends on, so on, on the context and how this is done. Um, and there's a lot of literature about fandom and consumer behavior um, in sports psychology and sport management literature is around the behaviors of fans and, you know, how the context can ramp up or down fan behavior, fan identity, and et cetera. So you, you can immerse yourself in that if you want. But I think, you know, as a, as a feminist sports scholar who consumes a lot of sports, I love sports, I'm watching sports all the time, um, I sometimes have conflict in watching football, and I love college football, pro not so much, but I love college sports. But I'm thinking, when my fan behavior, that I'm implicitly condoning the fact that young men, some of whom I teach, are getting concussions or being injured, um, et cetera, and I'm consuming that as a fan, am I okay with that? So, I wrestle with that a lot. Um, so, I, um, I don't know, I, I, I believe that very much what we're watching is transmitted, right? You know, but there was a time when I said, well, maybe not that much. And um, you got to influence sports that I'm watching influence me. And, and then I was, um, I was watching little kids at this Y where I was working out at. And I just wanted to watch little kids play, just, uh, just basketball. And uh, well, they're having a good time. I'm watching with them, having fun. And they call a timeout, and uh, these two kids run up and they chest bump. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> they were five. <laughs> I'm like, where did they learn to do that? And it's not that it have anything wrong. I think anything's wrong with chest pumping, but for me, that's like, whoa, oh my god, what they're watching on TV influences them and they're going to imitate it. And I think we have to be aware of some of that. Um, what, what do we, um, as fans and as observers, do we, do we understand how this is going to impact us? And there it was for me, these little kids. I'm still thinking about uh, her point and Marsha and, and Nicola, and how difficult it is to moralize to be consistent. So if, if uh, that's a challenge that we all go through, how to be moral and how to be consistent. So as spectators, I find myself in this bind uh, all the time. How to be consistent? If I determine through rational argumentation that I should not be watching football, and I do that. But if, if, if I know that some people, not just in Malaysia, but also here, are being abused because of the clothing I use, can I stop using this and do something else? And I don't have an answer to that, but it, could, it, it troubles me. You know, how to be moral. And, and that's the challenge of life. Unless we are automatons and we just don't care. Some of what you said about the positives and negatives of sports, how it can contribute, or in English even, clarity. Uh, 
uh, and also like what's the difference between maybe like, providing their audience. Um, the first thing that comes up is uh, play, I think, um, would ideally be a part of sport. You know, um, that, that having fun, um, although, you know, as we get older, um, and we uh, yeah, get older in sport, we tend to lose the fun. It usually happens around. Seventh or eighth grade, you know, and, but then, then, it start, then we start moving towards um, that sport becomes almost a business. And uh, so uh, play almost implies for me uh, that there's a fun element, that, that there's a freedom part of it. Not that play can't be a part of sport later, but um, it's almost sometimes it, it, it just. When winning became, becomes the only thing, when winning becomes too important, um, when you get into the higher level of sports, our identity tends to be wrapped up. In, uh, so it's not that play can't be a part of NFL football or the NBA or whatever. Um, but, yeah, anyway, that, that's, that's a shot at it. You guys. My understanding of McIntyre, and this is not my area of expertise, is that in play, the ideal for internal good was more likely to happen. Is that right? Yeah, the felicity. Yeah. That's a huge question. I mean, the philosophy of sport, we are still uh, you know, do, dealing with this conceptual work. Uh, we, we talk about these triads, play, games, and sport. What are they? How do they relate to each other? What's the potential? And so on. Um, if you are interested in this, I would recommend um, Bernard Schutz, and uh, a book that was published originally in 1978, uh, in which he developed a philosopher at um, Waterloo University, and passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, a huge influence in the philosophy of the sport. And he developed his uh, theory of what a game is. In, in that book. It's called The Grasshopper Games, Life, and Utopia. It's a terrific read. Yes. Uh, and, and he makes a distinction uh, between play and games and sports being a species of game. So some people argue these are two different things. Games are activities. Play is a way of being in the world, to use some phenomenological uh, terminology. It's a way of experiencing an activity. It's a way of relating to the activity. That is not exclusive to sport. It might happen at any time. The thing is that I agree uh, with Dr. Hoskins uh, yes, that, that uh, it gets to a point in which we are too much concerned about external rewards, the business of life, and we lose track of the intrinsic value of things. But Going back to ancient Greece, the good life was about finding things that were intrinsically rewarding. So it's, it's, it's tough. Um, I think that one of the keys is how to make play happen. How can we provide conditions in life, in many different activities, from music to theater to math to science to sport, so play flourishes. Uh, Von Schiller used to say that uh, we were at our best when we play. But it's very difficult to define what play is. So one, one of the uh, things that I, uh, I wrote down when uh, he was talking, uh, Aquinas, Merton, Cooper, Burgess, Brown, Lavoie, what is it? What is play? And we're still you know, grappling with, with, that, uh, with that question. So an um, unsatisfactory answer, probably. But uh, life is unsatisfactory sometimes. Yeah.
Conversations, Terry, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about a previous conversation that we've had. And you asked me the question last year, if you remember, of how do some how some of those basketball players keep in perspective that they won the thing? You know, that that's what I think interesting for me. Let's talk about paradoxes here. So, you know, it, it, it's problematic when you win. It can be it can be it can be problematic when you lose. So how do they keep in the midst of, and not just them, it's also the rest of us. And because the can't, whole campus felt this, you know, honestly. I know not everybody here is from Villanova, but um, we felt. So how to keep perspective, to see clearly about um, where's their identity in the midst of um, winning and losing, it, can they maintain joy of playing even when they lost? You know, you know, can they, um, you know, maybe it was in one sense easier last year, but this year it, it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and, and how, where did they go? I mean, I, I, I have the hope that they know that their professor said thank you to them and they'll take that home with them and, you know, because they're probably, you know, Speaking, maybe sulking a bit, but they can get over it. But, but just to bring, to say thank you to them, to say, hey, it, it is, we're still with you. You're still uh, members of our team, no matter if you won or if you lost. And, 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 and to try to maintain that joy. I, that's not easy. I was going to ask back to you, but. But I think, don't you think that, I mean, it goes back to it depends on the adults around these young men to help them frame up their experience to say, hey, you won the national championship, great. This year you lost. This is the educational component of sport. And if we're only fixated on winning um, and we're trying to win, that's great. But it, it depends on the adults, the coach, the administration, the professors, their parents to say, you know what? 
you lost, but you can still last with grace. You can still be a good sport. You can still be a good student. Um, you know, in 20 years from now, they're going to look back and they will know what this meant to them. And what it will mean to them will largely be dictated by the adults who helped them interpret that. And that's the goal of the educational context. You know, as, as you speak, I totally agree with that. And um, a story that I heard um, from Father Rob Hagen, who was intimately involved with that team, the chaplain for the men's basketball team, he tells a story that, and so at least as one of those adults that you're talking about, Nicole, that can help get get the, the young people through some of this stuff. He, he told the story that after Villanova won the national championship, the day after, Jay Wright, before they got on the bus to come home, he had the presence of mind to say, please, as they're getting on the bus, he said to the team, please do not allow the rest of your life to be determined by that win. No, and I don't know if he did this this year, but I hope Jay did. Please don't allow that loss to determine who you are for the rest of your life. Um, but I, I took consolation both times, or was listening to, to, to hear that Jay said that to the players and, and to say, please don't do that. You won, but that this is not the rest of your life. And 20 years later, people may remember it, but you can't live just on that. Um, I, I think, just real quick, I'm thinking back to Wilt, my mentor, you know. Um, there's a kind of a story that was told with the Davis Tennis is that one of us went up to Wilt and he's like, oh, how'd your match go? And, um, you know, said, oh, we won. And he gave us a hug. And then we say, well, you know, if he would have lost, he would have hugged you twice as hard. Mm -hmm. As my colleagues here are saying, you know, the leadership is important. And maybe what we need to do um, is to make explicit what do we understand by competition, for example. To have a, a position. The athletic department has this position. We understand competition in a mutualistic way. Okay. Um, at institutions like this one, you have this figure, which is very interesting. You have a team chaplain. Okay. What about having something equivalent for secular institutions could be a philosopher. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So someone can question with the team what happened, but not from a psychological perspective. You know, oh, we lost, you know, how can we form a, No, what does it mean, all this? So maybe you have a little bit of an advantage here because of the tradition of a Catholic institution having this figure. But in a secular context, Something equivalent could be implemented as well. So I got this idea just listening to you, but make explicit what do we understand by competition? It seems that your athletic director has a couple of things right. He was talking about the values, and if those values are transmitted to the students, maybe they also were thankful that you thank them. There was a connection there for a moment. I wish that many professors. Stop by and tell the students, thank you. We're, we're uh, almost at the break, but I'm aware that uh, we haven't heard much from students yet. We've talked a lot about students, but we haven't heard from a lot of students uh, yet. And I'm, I'm curious if, if there are any students in particular that have a question or a comment that would like to, to get into the conversation at this point. Um, so so we were talking about like how sports kind of be done right, and um, I was wondering like if there are any like specific like, I don't want to say like not major characteristics, but like are like values and morals enough to, like to dictate whether sports can be done right? Yeah, one metric I commonly use. I do a lot of post education, so. I would argue that at secular schools, the person that can be that interpreter, not like the chaplain, should be the coach. Should be the coach. 
that helps these young people interpret their experiences. And that's why I do so much work in coach education because I strongly believe that a coach is a teacher first. Um, but in terms of doing it right, I always think of, okay, are they developing? And that's in all areas, you know, spiritual, moral, physical, social, emotional development. Are they having a good experience, meaning is it fun and enjoyable, back to the joy? And are they performing to the best of their ability? Not that they have to win, but they're striving to win. And now you can do all three, but it takes thought and intention. So usually we're like, well, we can try to win, but then we're not going to have fun, or, you know, one gets sacrificed. But I think when sports are done right, coaches and administrators are trying to get all three simultaneously. And that is possible. We know it's possible. And one of the things I'm working on right now um, is how do we teach coaches to be moral exemplars? If sport is an educational context, and coaches influence dramatically the lives of their athletes, how do we teach coaches to do that better? So that's a simplistic answer to your question. But it's a nice little framework I use a lot when I'm thinking about this. You know, it's an interesting point there, Nicole. You know, we usually don't have much coaching, coaches training. Usually, how it happens it is how it happens it's almost like an apprenticeship for coaches you go with a coach and you learn by watching that coach and you um, coaching yourself is what it was for me um, here as a grad assistant under Roy Massimino. It, it was no and, and you just and I think the, the thing that I was Struggled with there is, is it was it was almost like um, he, he was gonna he, he was gonna somehow influence me um, intuitively. There was not any actual instruction, and I think that's the way that we dealt with coaching. It's, it's almost like it's an apprenticeship. There's not no class necessarily, and there are, but in, in major college coaches, most people just learn by doing and have a mentor and it's almost as i said like an apprenticeship well the teacher coach model of coaches were taught to be physical educators yeah. and taught how to teach that's gone so you're right it's an apprenticeship model and if your apprentice is a knucklehead then yeah. you're going to get some character <laughs> so one of the things we could do in the training of coaches is to have more uh, more education, because I would argue that the most challenges a coach faces are not technical challenges. They are very well qualified to deal with defenses, offenses, whatever it is, but they are not highly or equally qualified to deal with the moral challenges that come with a sport. That's why I would argue that um, maybe the secular chaplain, that doesn't make sense, I know, <laughs> but uh, 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 should be an independent figure, right? So someone who can take a step back and, and look at the situation and tell. Yeah. And I, just one, one reflection, and I agree on a, almost everything that my colleague said, but I wonder whether we make too much of fun and joy. Folks, life is tough. Living is difficult. And not everything could be fun. I think that in the English language, the word fun is overused. Everything has to be fun. Everything has to be meaningful, I would say but not necessarily fun. Hopefully, it will lead to fun, but I think that um, things are more complex. And I'm not minimizing the role of fun, but I think that maybe meaning or satisfaction or human flourishing uh, could be a better indicator mm -hmm. to, uh, to throw into the mix that uh, aspect. So, so it's a great question that you asked. And, and I'm, when I say fun, I'm not talking about, you know, like this tickle and giggle kind of fun. I'm talking about it's enjoyable because it's inherently rewarding in and of itself, the internal good. That, that's what I mean. And, and I mean more so, so, uh, societally, how, how this is viewed. Uh, if it's not fun, it's not worth it. Well, 
So when the, uh, the conveners of this conversation we got together last spring, we had managed, we had uh, imagined two panels. And the first one was to lay down the theological and philosophical foundations of, of, of sport and play, uh, and then to move towards cultural engagement in the second panel. But you can see the two are interrelated, so the conversations bleed and intermediate from one another. 